things that we had um, that sort of uh, the band was was very interested in from the beginning, and one of the reasons that we they donated the collection to UCS was because we had always planned on having some sort of an online component of really trying to take this massive collection that a lot of it contributed by fans and actually trying to put it back and make it available so people can go in and see what they, the fact that the band really want to show you, yes, we really appreciated what you guys did for us and we kept it all, you know, so people can find themselves in the archive. We got the archive in 2008, and then we uh, got a grant from the uh, IMLS, which is the Institute for Museum and Library Studies, a federal, it's a federal agency, to start to look at um, put together the online archive, but then we also wanted to sort of put one of the, re it's a research grant, and what we really wanted to do is sort of push the envelope on a few different things. For us here, we really wanted to sort of jumpstart our digitization and digital library program, because we really hadn't been doing very much before this. Very small collections of, you know, a couple hundred items, and now all of a sudden we had agreed for this grant to do 45,000 items, so this was going to be a big uh, step, and we had been really focused on digital images, and we were going to be doing all sorts of different materials and we also so we wanted to jumpstart our, our collection our program we wanted to really focus on um, the socially constructed nature of archives and what could we really do here's a here's a great archive that already had been socially constructed from the beginning of just fans sending things to the to the to the band but also can we take additional materials because we know there are thousands of people with garages full of stuff from when they they follow the band and so uh, we wanted to say, can we also take a, a more materials and can we have them, this really, you know, very knowledgeable group of people who are still alive and still, you know, very active in the community, can we, can they help us flesh out the metadata and the description of the materials that we have? And then could we also push the idea of intellectual property assessment because a lot of the stuff is still in copyright. A lot of archives are very worried about making materials available uh, and digitizing materials because we don't, you know, the idea of trying to do an intellectual property assessment on each individual item that comes in is just overwhelming. And so we keep a lot of this stuff hidden from people. And so we really wanted to see what could we do to push this uh, this archive out there. And because the Grateful Dead had such a, you know, long tradition of being open to putting the materials out there and letting the fans actually share with the materials, we thought this would be a really good way of starting to try to push some of those boundaries. So we selected a wide range of material. So we have a lot of the stuff that was in the um, the, arc, the in the Dead Central. So we have uh, fan envelopes, which are really the, probably the biggest. That we did 15. We scanned over 16,000 fan envelopes. Um, we also have lots of photographs and uh, posters. There's the posters that the band actually had for their own shows, but then they also have. Uh, a collection of just posters of bands that they knew, and Nick had a poster collection that he had personally, and that he donated to the archive, and there were a couple other um, poster collections, so there's a really good, that, that's a really good part of it. There's uh, the, um, the band, because they had their own ticket, ticket line, what they would do is people could call up, and you know, this is before the age of the internet, you could call up a, a ticket line recording, and hear the um, Eileen Law, or Richard, I forget what his last name is, but anyway, you could get the, um, a listing of what the shows were going to be, and so they kept all these these voicemail recordings over the years, and so you can you know, we digitized all of those. You can go and listen to their information about the shows that were going to be played. The band sometimes left little messages on um, that answering machine recording, so those are kind of fun to listen to now. A lot of the audio um, interviews from radios and things like that. So we have a broad range of materials. 3D um, objects, backstage props, T-shirts, things like that. So we really wanted to you know, see what we could do and really jumpstart. So now we can digitize everything we have in special collections because we did a little bit of everything in order to get the, um, the Grateful Dead uh, site up online. We also wanted to, um, you know, try to do, we knew we were going to get all this information in from the band, from, from the crowd, but we also wanted to, you know, we're librarians and we have, met, we have authorities and metadata and things like that. We knew we wanted to expose these records in larger places and, you know, we, we'd have this site that we wanted to put our stuff into, but we also thought, you know, this could be harvested and put into other archives and things like that. So we started out, there is a, um, it's a loose structure, but there is actually metadata and authority. So we have a name authority file and it's amazing how many people from uh, involved in the organization our library library cover subject terms. Um, and so Nick and our uh, metadata uh, cataloger, um, Belinda 
uh, again, created this name authority file that we checked against LCE. And we also have, you know, we're using Getty, Thesaurus, um, and TGN, and things like that. So we actually have, uh, we checked all the venues and things like that for the authority. So we have these two sort of setups of, with lots of authorities as well as um, sort of, you know, uh, a, a new vocabulary that was not, ex that didn't, that the band is now, or the fans are now adding in our comments. Um, so in the end, 15,000 fan decorated envelopes, 10,000 photos. So a lot of those photos that are in the collection, we did we digitized as much as we could. We had in the first to cool. So those were slides. These are a lot of these are like you know single photos that were just sent in from fans. But it also has her green and um, some professional photographers like Susanna Millman. Um, we had tickets from their ticket stubs, and the tickets are sometimes these. Um, you know, as Nick was saying, they're the Ticketmaster copies, but then they're also the band, the copies that the band actually uh, sold and distributed. Um, so it's nice these comparison of how they, you know, the artwork that was in, involved with those. Uh, posters, those audio recordings, t-shirts, the fanzine issues that were up there, as well as Dick Ball in one of his notebooks we um, scanned, and the lamp, backstage laminates for the backstage passes. And you know we have tons. A lot of what's going to go into the next exhibit is fan art contributions, and so we just picked 50 items because that was the last thing we were trying to get before we launched. But there are um, that's our, I think so a place where we can really expand. I mean, incredible artwork that people sent in. It's just um, so we just have a few examples. So here's the website. We um, launched. Are we that we seeded it basically with these 45,000 items? But we are asking people to continue to contribute their own items. And so people, when they come in, they can click on that thing and you can upload then any of your own images, stories, things like that. So we're asking people to continue adding in. So just, and also, you know, as we were, Nick was saying, you know, we have a, you know, it's an archive and we have a, um, a, a responsibility to archive all of these materials that people are coming in. So we want to do a submission workflow. So user, if a user clicks that contribute button and puts their materials in, it becomes publicly available right away, which I think some people thought, you're going to put stuff up, what have people put porn in? But uh, we have actually, we ask people to you, to flag inappropriate content, and we have had very little, or actually almost none, no inappropriate content that people have actually put in, um, you know, photos and things like that, and which has really been, you know, we're trusting the community to, you know, to sort of um, curate themselves, but also to, you know, um, only put materials that are worthy of it, and it's been actually a successful experiment so far. No one has actually been, you know, malicious. But so if we have audio files, we copy them into Cultura, which is a streaming service, and also video files, and those are, though, embedded in our Omega website. Um, we have images that go into our standard image viewer, and then we have, and if Nick decides that one of the objects that came in is worth curating, is something that is, um, you know, adds a uh, content to the collection, we will put it in our uh, digital repository for long-term storage and archiving. And then for the materials that we uh, have digitized, which are at a higher level than what most people are, you know, a lot of them are, you know, phone pictures and things like that. So our materials were digitized at, you know, higher levels. So we put them into Content DM, which is our local con uh, uh, digital asset management system. We put our images into a shared drive, and then basically they're, but, we're using a, a, a service called Jitoka, and what that does is it, or J2K, depending on how you want to pronounce that. But it's an open source uh, system that will actually create derivatives, but allows you to really deep and do a deep zoom in and really see, you know, signatures on the posters from the artists and things like that. So it's a little bit more. Um, this deep zoom gives a little bit more information, a little bit more information than a regular image file might be viewable at. And again, our audio files and video files are going into Cultura. We really focused on trying to do as much open, because this is a federal grant, almost everything we used was open source. So Omeka is open source, and um, uh, which is a digital asset management system that was created at uh, George Mason University in Virginia, and they're very well funded by IMLS, and so that's one of the reasons that we, in order to get the grant, we knew that Omeka would be, a, would be compelling to them. So some of the features, um, we have this uh, Nick and, um, uh, De developed a list of all of a uh, authoritative list of all the venues that they played in, and so then we went out and grabbed uh, the co the geographic coordinates of all of those different venues, and then we threw put them into a Google map and um, a go uh, customized Google map. And so when you click on any one of those uh, shows, you get a little pop up box, and you can search for items that were related to this venue. But you can also, you know, there were some things that they played in. Um, 
on farms and things like that that we don't have you know specific geographic coordinates and so we're asking the crowd to let us know if they know of something different and I was, I've been surprised we've had at least 10 comments of people saying you know this building actually changed names and it's over on this side of the campus from where it played and you know things like that and so we know exactly and they will write us a six paragraph you know, uh, letter telling us exactly why we are wrong, and you know, and so it's been good. So we've been really able to let be been much more accurate. So this has been a very interesting. Uh, we also have are using a feature of a plugin in OMAP called Neatline, that allows you to do timelines. And so Nick created the sort of what we were calling the hundred greatest hits or the hundred the hundred biggest uh, milestones in the history of the, of the dead. And so they're plotted out on a timeline. And then there's a little bit of an overview about why that is a significant item. And then you can click on related resource. And sometimes we'll actually go into the archive if there are materials from the archive about that I, uh, that um, event. Or it will go into a, you know, this is a Wonderland ballroom, so it goes into the um, description in Wikipedia that gives you a little bit more information. We can also browse by poster artists and photographers. And so you can kind of get an idea of, uh, you know, the number of items that people went in that are in the, in the collection. And um, so here's our media. So we have the video recordings, which are probably the most um, uh, conservative intellectual property. We only put a few <coughs> recordings in there because those are, we had, uh, you know, uh, uh, we were lucky enough to have a librarian on staff who also has a law degree, and she was part of this process of putting together everything. But she's now moved on to the California Digital Library, and I've got some slides at the end that she actually put in, so I can only speak a little bit about our, until our, our, our but Nick and I were very, you know, we went to meetings weekly for a year <laughs> to talk about intellectual property. But so we have some video recordings, and they had a whole record, they kept, they kept VHS recordings of, all sorts of different interviews and things like that. And so we've got some snippets uh, of, of a couple of recordings. They also have these audio recordings and some of these are radio broadcasts and some of these are those ticket line. But, um, you know, we, they're still recording. So we don't, we're, we didn't want to uh, put music on the show, uh, in the site that is competing with Grateful Dead Productions, which is still releasing, for, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> records or CDs. So we wanted to launch with music, and so we have a, the, you know, all of those tapes that were traded over the years have now been digitized by fans and deposited in the Internet Archive. And so what we uh, worked on a deal with the Internet Archive, that we have a, um, a uh, feed of all of their metadata from all of those shows that we've embedded in the site, but all of these recordings where you can actually listen to all of these different shows, you can, um, you're listening to the stream that's coming from the Internet Archive, and so you can listen to the music, see the poster, see the photo photography, see the envelopes that were sent into that, all of that is all around one, uh, you know, record. But you can, but we, you know, it was really nice that, that we could actually include the music from the different shows. We also have a Dead News blog, which Nick writes regularly um, with lots of, you know, information about uh, new accruals and things like that, new things that were coming in, and that's embedded in the site also. And um, one of the str strengths of Omeka is that you can do exhibits. And so these are like sort of online versions of what will go into the, the physical exhibit. But we can pull materials from the online archive and then add in context and sort of background and those great stories that Nick was just you know, telling and things like that. So these will be, we've got two up right now, one on Europe 72 and the posters of the Grateful Dead. And then um, we'll try to do a, a, a limited version of the, of the uh, exhibit that's in there right now as well as the next one go in. So, so far, out of contributions, this is the big push was to try to get as many people to contribute materials as possible. We had 50 submissions since we launched in July. About six of those have been stories, so people, you know, um, tell, talking about their experience with the dead, why, how they became a deadhead, what their favorite show was, things like that. Um, and about 45 images, and those have been photos and posters, tickets, things like that. And so um, these are just some examples. And we've asked people to review them and you know uh, uh, let us know, flag them for inappropriate content. But again, as we haven't actually had any that have been flagged. We're also uh, having people tag materials and tag items that have gone in. 58 tags created and about 150 items tagged. And this is an issue, Omeka and the tagging, there's a, something wrong with that plugin and so it doesn't work very well. And so I think that actually we would probably have more of these if it, if it worked a little bit more. <laughs> Um, but this is, a, we could go in and we can edit tags and delete tags, but this is something that people when they tag materials, it automatically goes, the tag goes live.
Um, we've had 600 comments, which I think is, uh, you know, this is one of our success stories, and only about 100 of them have been spam or inappropriate, you know, just things that when people are trying to sell things. But for the most part, they've been corrections to our metadata, or, um, you know, just compliments or things like that, or people are asking questions and, you know, for further information. So it's actually been really interesting to watch conversations even happen between commenters. So here's one where somebody um, helped us identify this person and they go again and describe exactly how they know who that person is and, and then we can comment back and explain and help thank them for the correction. And then we'll go in and have our mitigator catalog. We can go in and actually add in those subject terms. So as I said, one of our options was we really wanted to push the intellectual property um, issues and develop a strategy for this that could then be used by other archives. Look at the different materials that went in there because everything has been published pretty recently. Uh, the only a few dozen things from the posters that were uh, that were published in the public they were published without a copyright notice before 1978 were in the public domain. But everything else that went into the the archive is kind of, is, collect, is protected by copyright. So what we decided to do, uh, uh, you know, we uh, tried to get licenses signed by as many people as we could, and we decided that by looking at the, um, uh, you know, looking at the fair use law and the fines uh, for uh, the code of best practices that just came out for academic and research libraries, that we could really rely on fair use to actually put these materials out there with a takedown policy that if someone claims their right, we'll take it down. And uh, so we had, we knew we had strong cases for these materials, and I have to say, Katie put those little stars by the tickets, photos, and posters, and I don't know what that, what those asterisks mean. I, I should probably take them out. But um, we had weaker cases on the periodicals and the, the video, and you, that's why we have we have fewer things on there. A lot of also the audio. These are interviews that people did not sign off. They did not realize that someday these might be going on the internet because the internet didn't exist. And so a lot of those there's privacy issues. Really, they're not really. Uh, it's not very intellectual property, but it's just privacy. So there's some materials that we just probably won't ever put out, but maybe just smaller snippets. But so we did uh, do an attempt to, you know, Nick and uh, we had an assistant, uh, Sarah Lindsay, who did uh, a phenomenal uh, amount of work to try to locate all of these rights holders and actually send letters and try to get people to actually sign off. And Nick would, you know, call people and be very kind and try to cajole them into just getting back to us. It's not even, you know, just sign the license, but just let us know if you got it. So out of those people that we actually sent materials out, uh, them we were not found, and a lot of them we didn't even have any response whatsoever. Uh, but we did get a, a, sign, a fair number of signed licenses, and actually since we assigned this, I think we've actually had probably seven or eight new signed licenses, so that that might be a little bit bigger. But only very few refusals of people who just said, no, I don't want my materials out there. So what we decided at the end, in the end, when you look at the numbers, we've, we're using fair use for the vast majority. All of those envelopes are up using <coughs> fair use. And um, for the, there's only a small amount of public domain and a few licenses, some separate licenses, that sign some that are coming actually just out of the deed of gift from the big end but we're really relying heavily on fair use. And we've had no, we've had requests since then to uh, remove uh, some materials, mostly out of privacy issues, but none out of, um, you know, copyright of people asserting, asserting their copyright. Um, but for the, for people who actually contribute their new items that are coming through the website, we're asking them to either sign a license over to the UC Regents to display, they always maintain their own copyright but they can either sign a license to the UC Regents or they can check a box on the form that um, puts their materials out to for Creative Commons. And um, here's just some of the resources uh, that you can, <laughs> what you can and can't put up. And that's it. Any questions or comments? How do you deal with uh, uh, Nick mentioned all the pirate and bootleg recordings that are out there. How do you deal with that with the uh, audio files? Because some will release through every company, but many are floating around. With well, the, the most of the ones that are online that we're doing through the Internet Archive are taped shows that were, you know, live shows. We're not doing sound uh, soundboards, correct? Well, they don't, the Internet Archive doesn't post soundboards. It does, but okay. it's streaming only. Okay. You can okay. download, if you go to Internet Archive, you can download any audience recording, but any soundboard is streamed, and then if Grateful Dead Productions has released 
an official version of that soundboard, then that is withdrawn. But uh, what I was talking about was actually technically not, the term bootleg is vague, it, recover, it, it covers both, both pirates, which are an attempt to reproduce an official recording and make it look legitimate, and that's what sunk the record company. That we wouldn't ever put up because that's, that's a, a, a straight, that's a counterfeit of an official release. And so those aren't, aren't part of the Internet Archive and that's, and that's not, not part of the, the site. We have bootlegged, I mean, or like fake posters and things like that, though, which right. I think would be an interesting exhibit someday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and the bootleg posters, and that covers both, both categories. That, that, you know, copyright infringements where somebody has tried to fake, because some of the posters now are worth, you know, thirty and forty thousand dollars. And the minute you get into that kind of money, people do create convincing looking fakes, but the bigger majority are, are just fan made efforts that were sold at parking lots and things like that. And those are often quite wonderful. But didn't the band have a very liberal policy to van taping? Yes, although not as liberal as people today like to say. Actually, in the 1970s, it was very much a tussle between fans and the roadies and, and even the sound people who really didn't approve of it. That didn't change fundamentally until Jerry started weighing in heavily and, and essentially telling the rest of the, the band that this is okay, we should let it go forward. And then in 1983, they inaugurated an official taper section and allowed people, so, so yeah, it was, it, it was gradual over time. People started actually fan taping as early as, I think the earliest fan recording, one of the earliest is, is a very famous 1968, a March 3rd, 1968 uh, fan recording. But, um, but it, really, it really takes off in the 1970s. And fans would do things like go into a venue and hide a car battery and a taping rig in the bathroom the day before a show <laughs> so that they could actually, or you know, smuggle it in underneath a wheelchair. Um, just incredible stories, but, but yeah. You can see in the envelopes, there's a lot of people asking to be in the taper section this is the live site. I did this PowerPoint because I when we originally did the internet library and I was well worried that the uh, um, you know we didn't know what kind of network connection we had. Yeah. But so I could have showed you some stuff. This is a there, so we yeah you just posted for, I guess that's from January the latest uh, Dead Dead News blog. I have a question. So does the collection include any um, analog recordings and if so are you working on transferring them to digital? Uh, of the of the actual the music of the band, yeah, or or just in general, anything historical thing that's. Uh, well, I, I mean, it has a lot, We have lots of analog recording. Whether we will digitize them is another question. I think that we we don't have anything that isn't already out there. We don't have anything that's unique. Uh, the two big repositories are the band's own vault, and that's the band controls all of their own audio and video. That's explicitly spelled out in terms of the deed of gift. Um, and that is voluminous, and there are a lot of things that have not circulated that are, that are part of that. Uh, there are, and some materials crop up periodically. Uh, their second key or third keyboard player, uh, there was a batch of materials given to him when he was brought into the band uh, in 1971, and those tapes materialized. So, so some archival sources, materialize, but those belong to the band and that's that's handled by them. I don't think in terms of fan materials, there's absolutely nothing that we have that isn't on Internet Archive. Internet Archive really has an extraordinary collection. It's not always accurately described, but it's an incredible, uh, yeah, and, well, but much of it is accurately described. And, if you and read the, I mean, it's fan curated. You read the arguments back and forth between the people. You know? Oh, yeah. They're pretty funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, we have a lot of spoken word, and we could digitize them, but I think that, you know, we would, why digitize something that's already been digitized at a very high quality the studio done by the band itself? So I think eventually we could preserve those materials for the band, you know, long term, and we could, you know, that would be part of the archiving. But while they're still releasing, I think that we would just kind of let it, letting them on their own. Well, Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.